just give it a moment, Madeline, for the room to fill up and then we'll, we'll get started. Okay. Well, the number's still creeping up. <laughs> okay, well, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for um, this, the penultimate um, lecture in our core uh, lecture series. Um, today, we're delighted to be um, joined by Madeline Moberg, who is from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is an independent global research center based at the University of Washington in Seattle. And the IHME um, looks at the world's most important health problems and evaluates the strategies used to address them. They make this information freely available so policy makers have the evidence they need to make informed decisions about how to allocate resources to best improve population health. Their mission is to improve the health of the world's populations by providing the best information on population health. Madeline's responsible for producing the fatal and non-fatal estimates of carbon monoxide poisoning for the Global Burden of Disease, Injuries and Risk Factor Study, the GBD. She also is a modeler for a number of other injury-related topics, and they include transport and road injuries, drowning and self-harm. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Madeline. Um, if you could put any questions you have, Madeline, in the chat, and what we'll do is we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Um, so without further ado, please can I hand over the floor to Madeline, please. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. I think I got my screen all set up and ready to go. I appreciate the introduction and I'm really happy to be here today and to share um, results with you from a paper that we published recently on um, fatal carbon monoxide poisoning from the Global Burden of Disease Study. I probably don't need to introduce myself too much since Adrian did such a good job of um, saying kind of who I am and what we do at IHME, but just briefly, um, as he mentioned, my name is Madeline Moberg, and I'm a researcher at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is based in Seattle, Washington in the United States. And as Adrian mentioned, I've worked for over four years on a variety of injury-related topics, and one of those is carbon monoxide poisoning, which of course is why I'm here today. So I'm excited to share results with you from a paper we published last fall about carbon monoxide poisoning deaths around the world. So the idea that I wanted to start with um, for this presentation that we also centered our paper around is um, the idea, which hopefully all of you are totally on board with, is that carbon monoxide poisoning, specifically unintentional carbon monoxide poisoning, is largely preventable as a cause of death. But in order to reduce these carbon monoxide poisoning deaths, we need to, we need to know where they are occurring and to whom they are occurring. And so this is something that GBD allows us to exactly do. And that's what um, our paper demonstrated. We demonstrated how we can accomplish this. And that's what I'm going to share with you today through this presentation. So here I'm showing you just a screenshot of the abstract from our paper, which was published in the Lancet Public Health in fall of 2023. So this paper shares the results from our latest global burden of disease study for carbon monoxide poisoning deaths from 2000 to 2021. And in the paper, we've described um, trends in carbon monoxide poisoning mortality over time, as well as patterns in carbon monoxide mor poisoning mortality by age and sex, and the geographical distribution of carbon monoxide poisoning deaths. So it, this paper and our analysis uses the Global Burden of Disease or GBD studies framework for cause of death modeling to estimate these deaths due to carbon monoxide poisoning. And in our, um, the rest of my presentation today, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the data sources we use for this analysis, as well as the methods. Um, but I'm hoping to spend and planning to spend the most amount of time talking about the main findings from this paper and specifically trying to answer a few different questions. So I'm hoping you'll come away from this knowing where people are dying, at what age people are dying, whether there are differences between males and females and how carbon monoxide poisoning mortality has changed over time based on our study and our estimates. So before I get too much into the paper, I wanted to briefly talk about what the 
Global Burden of Disease Study is, in case this is new to anyone in the audience today. So GBD stands for the Global Burden of Diseases, Risk Factors, and Injuries Study. And this project tries to answer some of the following questions. So we try to answer what makes people sick, what are people dying from, how many people are dying, and what risks lead to health loss. So these are just some of the questions that this project tries to answer. And in general, the Global Burden of Disease Study is a regularly updated set of estimates of burden of disease on a global level. And we report um, a collective set of estimates for incidence, prevalence, mortality, and many um, associated risk factors for all the conditions that we make estimates for. And I've included this visual here just to demonstrate the breadth of what GBD tries to accomplish. So this plot shows um, just I think it's a good visual to show just how many different things we try to capture as part of GBD. So it shows you the proportion of different causes of death and the among everyone that dies in the world, how those um, causes of death are distributed. So you can immediately get a sense of the number of things that we're trying to do with GBD. So I thought this was a good visual to kind of just represent that. And as I'm getting at, um, the Global Burden Disease Study provides global estimates at a really granular level. So as I kind of hinted at, we make estimates for 371 different diseases and injuries, and 288 of those are specifically different types of cause or different causes of death. Additionally, we make estimates for 88 different risk factors that contribute to all of those diseases and injuries. Um, GBD makes estimates for 204 countries and territories across 25 different age groups by both males and females and from 1990 to 2021. So it's a pretty comprehensive effort to try to understand where in the world people are sick and what they're dying from and how many people are dying every year. So when I think about GBD and think about what we need in order to make all these estimates of health loss, there are kind of three different components we need before we can get to the stage where we're actually making estimates. So the first is that we need a clear case definition for whatever our topic is. Secondly, once we have a clear case definition, we need to be able to identify data sources that provide us information on that topic based on our clear case definition. So this, for example, for carbon monoxide poisoning could be information on deaths or perhaps um, like hospital visits for people who have been poisoned. Once we have um, all of our available data for our given topic, then we need a modeling tool that can combine all the information from these data sources and make predictions or estimates for all locations, ages, sexes, and years as part of the GBD. So these are kind of the different components that I am going to talk through today for carbon monoxide poisoning specifically, as I share with you what our methods are and then what our results are from the paper and from GBD. So I wanna start with defining what carbon monoxide poisoning is as part of GBD and how we capture carbon monoxide poisoning deaths. So for mortality, I think the best way to define this is using the ICD codes that are used to um, assign this cause of death. So here I've listed the specific codes from ICD-10 since most of our data post 2000 uses the ICD-10 revision. And so these are the ICD codes that when um, used on a cause of death certificate, we will then take those and say that those deaths were due to carbon monoxide poisoning. But I think the key thing that I want to make sure to emphasize on this slide is that these ICD codes and this um, GBD name for this topic, which is poisoning by carbon monoxide, really only captures unintentional non-fire related carbon monoxide poisoning. So this specific GBD cause of death does not capture deaths due to carbon monoxide poisoning during fires, and also does not capture intentional carbon monoxide poisoning like suicide um, by carbon monoxide poisoning. So when I'm talking about carbon monoxide poisoning today, I'm only talking about the unintentional non-fire related carbon monoxide poisoning piece. So I just wanna make sure that, that is clear before getting into the rest of the presentation. So once we have our case definition, like I said, the next thing that we need to think about is data. So where can we, um, where, what's the, like the available data landscape for our topic? And when I think about that, there are kind of a number of different key pieces that we need to um, assess whether we have good input data for our topic. 
And so from our data, what we need to know or what we want to know is, first of all, who is dying? So that could include demographic information like age and sex. We need to know where people are dying. So that will give us information on the geographic patterns of deaths over time. And then we also need to know when people are dying so that we have information on trends over time. And lastly, um, and probably most importantly, we need to know why people are dying. So we want to know detailed cause of death information, which often looks like the most granular ICD codes available in our data. And if a data source has all of these components, then we would consider it to be really useful and a high quality data source to give us information about our topic, in this case, um, carbon monoxide poisoning deaths. So where do we actually get our data um, from for carbon monoxide poisoning deaths in GBD? There are two main um, types of input data available as part of the Global Burden of Disease Study for carbon monoxide poisoning deaths. The first of these is vital registration data or vital registration records, which is the type of info that would be extracted from a cause of death certificate or a death certificate. And often this vital registration data has really detailed cause of death information using ICD codes. It often has really detailed age and sex information and is often available at a country level. So this checks all those boxes on the previous slide that I was discussing. Secondly, there's one other data type that's available to us for carbon monoxide poisoning deaths, and that is verbal autopsy surveys. And what this means is that um, this data comes from surveys with family members to assess the cause and circumstances of deaths. However, we actually, for carbon monoxide poisoning, only use the vital registration data because verbal autopsy data for carbon monoxide poisoning, when we reviewed it, has really small sample sizes and often reports zero deaths. So it's um, often pretty unreliable and that we don't necessarily believe that even though the source is reporting zero deaths, it's unlikely that that is accurate. So we've excluded that from our modeling process and only rely on vital registration data. That being said though, um, the quality of vital registration data can still vary between countries and over time. And this is something that we try to assess as part of GBD um, by understanding the completeness of each um, year and location of vital registration data that we have, as well as understanding um, for each year and location of this data type, the percentage of all deaths that are assigned to um, causes of death or ICD codes that cannot be um, underlying causes of death or are nonspecific. So for example, deaths that might have an ICD code assigned that for poisoning says the intent was undetermined or the type of poisoning was unspecified. This is something we try to assess as part of our data process. So with this map, I've demonstrated um, how much data we have across all years for carbon monoxide poisoning as part of GBD. So in total, this amounts to about 3,000 data sources around the world. But I think one of the key things to point out here is that you probably already can see right off the bat that there are certain countries and even entire geographic regions where we have very few data sources. Um, and so those would be the countries that have the yellow shaded or all, no coloring at all in the map. And so this poses really a challenge for us once we get to the modeling side. But I think um, it's just really interesting to point out before we get into kind of the modeling and the results from this analysis, that there's a really wide range in the availability of data around the world for this topic. And so what it means when I'm saying that there are um, 40 or 50 data sources available in parts of the United States or the UK, for example, is that often means that we have data for every year from at least one data source versus other countries where we maybe only have one year of data from one data source um, over time. So we've talked about the case definition we use for carbon monoxide poisoning, and we've talked about um, the available data we have for carbon monoxide poisoning in GBD. So the last thing I want to briefly touch on before just sharing results with you is talking about our modeling process. And so when I think about um, this step, I think um, first I want to mention, you know, why do we need a model in the first place? And I think the way that I would 
answer this is that it allows us to generate estimates in places where we don't have any data at all. And so on the previous slide, you saw that there are a number of countries where we don't have any data and modeling allows us to make predictions or make estimates for those places in the absence of data. And it also allows us to create smooth patterns over age and over years for countries where we do have some data. So this essentially allows us to assess the overall um, global patterns and creates like a comparability or creates a comparable set of estimates for us to look at the global patterns of carbon monoxide poisoning. And so what actually makes a good model? Once we have data, we need a tool to synthesize all of our information and make predictions. So the first thing, and probably the most important thing that I would say is that we want our models to be data driven so that in cases where we have a lot of data and we trust that our data reports an accurate count of deaths due to carbon monoxide poisoning, we want our, to use that information and we want our models to follow the data. However, in the absence of data, we want our model to use additional information to make predictions and to make those predictions reasonable. So this could entail drawing on information from nearby locations, um, such as neighboring countries or uh, nearby years and age groups to help inform um, years, ages, or countries that do not have data. Additionally, in the absence of data, our models can use information from contributing factors or covariates to help make estimates. So an example of this would be um, using information on the accessibility and quality of healthcare, for example, as that could relate to a person's chance of survival. Lastly, we also want our models to estimate uncertainty as a reflection of how confident we are in our estimates. So I'll briefly talk about the modeling tool we use to make these estimates of carbon monoxide poisoning mortality. So drawing on all the available data we have for carbon monoxide poisoning deaths, we use the cause of death ensemble model or CODEM framework, which is a tool commonly used um, at IHME across many topics on GBD that creates a diverse set of plausible models based on that data, as well as covariates that have a link to mortality, and then generates an ensemble that is a combination of those best performing models to make estimates for deaths around the world for every age, sex, GBD location, and year with a 95% uncertainty interval. So on this slide, I've included two different examples of what those model results themselves might look like. And so on the left, I've included I, on the left, I've included an example from England where we have many years of data. So you can see that all of those little yellow circles are data points for every um, year for males aged 55 to 59. And so in this case, you can see that the model, which is the blue line, is really closely following the data points, which is exactly what we would like to see is we would want um, the data to, or the model to follow the data in cases like this. However, on the right-hand side, I've included a different example, which is for our estimates in Morocco for females who are two to four years old. And you'll notice that on this side, we do not have any data points. So the model instead is relying on information from nearby countries, for example, or drawing on covariates, like I mentioned. And I think what you'll probably notice here right away is that the uncertainty interval around the blue model line, which is the blue shaded area that's much wider, um, on the Morocco plot, the uncertainty interval is much wider than it is for the plot on the left. And that's because we don't have as much information to um, draw on to create these estimates. So the last thing I wanted to mention briefly about our modeling process before getting into some results and sharing our estimates is um, a part of the process that's really important in the absence of data, which is predictive covariates. So our model formulas use covariates to help provide additional information to the model and generate estimates, particularly in the absence of data. Um, and so when I'm talking about covariates, what I mean is that um, it's a, a variable that's related to our outcome, which in this case is carbon monoxide poisoning deaths. And it's something that contributes additional information to help our models um, make estimates. And like I said, these play a role really only in the absence of data. But I think um, without getting too far into the technical details of this process, the main takeaway here that I wanted to share with everyone is that the covariate that was most influential in our models for carbon monoxide poisoning 
was temperature. So what that means is that the association that these models demonstrated was that lower temperature was associated with higher carbon monoxide poisoning mortality. And this makes sense um, based on my understanding of the literature and patterns we see for carbon monoxide poisoning deaths, where colder climates and colder winters often are correlated with less ventilation, more issues with heating equipment, or use of generators that can all pose higher risks for carbon monoxide poisoning. So you can see on the right of the screen that I've listed some of the other covariates that we considered for having relationships with carbon monoxide poisoning, but temperature bolded at the bottom was the one that was most influential for our models. So after describing both our data and our modeling tool, I'm excited to now switch gears to talk about our estimates themselves and some of the findings from our paper. So I'm going to share several of the figures that I included in the paper itself and share with you what I think are the key takeaways from each. So to start off here, I've included a plot that demonstrates the um, number of deaths globally over time from 2000 to 2021. And we found that there were almost 29,000 deaths in 2021, but this was a 32.5% um, decrease from the year 2000. So this shows um, that there's been a pretty substantial global decline in the number of deaths over the past 20 years. We can also look at these results in a much more granular way. And so on this plot, I've included a lot more information. So the left-hand side, um, shows the number of deaths due to carbon monoxide poisoning for females versus males on the right-hand side. Um, and these patterns are also visible in this plot over age. So we have the youngest ages at the bottom, all the way up to ages 85 plus at the top. And additionally, this plot also visualizes um, the number of deaths by different geographic regions. So you can get a lot of information from this plot. But I think one of the first things that I notice and that I would say is a key takeaway is that Male deaths are much more common than female deaths, and you can see that just comparing the two sides of this plot. And in fact, um, based on our results, male deaths accounted for more than two-thirds of all carbon monoxide poisoning deaths in 2021. You can also immediately see from looking at this plot that most deaths occur in adults, particularly um, those aged, um, I would say, 34 and above or 35 to 39 and above. And the 50 to 54 year age group, when we combine males and females, had the greatest number of deaths of any age group with over 2,200 deaths total. Also, interestingly, the um, age 85 plus age group is the only one where female deaths outnumbered male deaths, which I think is another um, key takeaway from this plot. Lastly, um, the other the last thing I would mention from this particular figure is that you can tell by the different colors of the plot that there were two geographic regions that contributed the greatest number of deaths. So one of those is Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia in blue, and then the other is Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Oceania in purple. So some of this is due to the fact that some of the countries that fall into these um, geographic regions are those that have really large populations, but some of them also have really high mortality rates for carbon monoxide poisoning specifically, which leads me right into my next slide. So this next figure is very similar to the one on the previous slide. The only difference is that this shows mortality rates by these different locations, um, sexes and age groups, rather than the number of deaths. And so on this slide, you can see that for most age groups, um, the mortality rates are highest in those blue bars. So that's for the Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia countries. And that's where we see the greatest mortality rates due to carbon monoxide poisoning in 2021 overall around the world. And then the only other thing that I would um, want to point out about this slide is that we also see that mortality rates are really high in elderly people, especially those aged 80 plus. And part of this is due to the fact that um, smaller population sizes, there are smaller population sizes at that age, so that accounts for part of this, but mortality rates are also quite high in those age groups. So with the next figure I want to show you, I want to talk about years of life lost, which is, in my opinion, one of the advantages of GBD is that 
we compute years of life lost, um, which is another way to frame loss of life aside from just looking at deaths and mortality rates. So um, years of life lost are computed as the number of remaining years of life that were lost based on remaining life expectancy at age of death. So what that means is that someone who's younger, like a child, for instance, will contribute a greater number of years of life lost than somebody who's 60, for example. And so this figure compares the number of years of life lost by age and by sex for people in 2021 due to carbon monoxide poisoning. And I think the first thing you will notice is that um, males contribute more YLLs at nearly every age than females, which is not surprising based on the previous plots we looked at where male death rates and um, numbers of deaths were often higher than females. But I think what is the really the key takeaway to me from this slide is that the under five age groups contribute more YLLs than many of the older age groups, despite that there are many more deaths later in the life course. And this is particularly true for females, where you can see that the greatest number of YLOs comes from those under five. And I think this really emphasizes the point that carbon monoxide poisoning impacts people of all ages, not just adults and not just elderly people, but it really impacts younger children as well. So as I've kind of been describing throughout the past few figures, the main focus of our paper was to describe regional patterns, but we did also report on country specific results and I wanted to share those as well. So this map um, demonstrates the mortality rates by country for carbon monoxide poisoning in 2021. And I think what this does is it allows you to visually see some of the geographic patterns I've been describing, particularly, for example, where parts of Central and Eastern Europe, Central Asia and East Asia have really high mortality rates. And you can tell that um, based on the coloring as the reddish orange colors are where we saw the greatest mortality rates in the year 2021. And particularly, the three countries that had the highest mortality rates were Moldova, Mongolia, and Russia, when we look at a ranking of all countries around the world. So this next map, instead of showing mortality in 2021, shows the percent change in mortality rate from 2000 to 2021 by country. And I think the first thing I would emphasize and hopefully um, is visually apparent is that this map looks quite different from the previous one color wise in that many of the countries that were red on the previous slide are now blue. Um, and what that means is that some of the countries um, who had the highest mortality rates in 2021, for example, much of Eastern Europe also has shown the greatest improvement over the past 20 years. So a lot of the countries that were blue on the um, on this slide, we're red on the previous one, which demonstrates that they've actually shown quite a bit of improvement over the last 20 years. Although you'll also notice on this map that there are some countries that have seen an increase in mortality since 2000, and those are the countries here that are um, the darker red and orange color. And while there's not a lot of them, it is um, a little bit concerning that there have been countries where carbon monoxide poisoning has increased in the past 20 years. Although the caveat that I want to make sure to mention with this is that many of these countries are places where carbon monoxide poisoning was already uncommon and there were small numbers of deaths to begin with. So a percent increase from a very small number of deaths is still a very small number of deaths, but it's something to keep an eye on nonetheless. And I think the main takeaway I want to um, share from this particular figure is that it tells a much different story than the very first figure I showed which seemed very optimistic in that there was just a continued global decline in mortality since 2000. Whereas this one shows that the, um, while there have been a lot of countries that have shown declines in the last 20 years, that's not consistently true across all locations. So to wrap up um, my discussion of results, I've listed here kind of what I, feel as are the key findings from our paper and from all of these figures. Firstly, that there were nearly 29,000 deaths in 2021. And as I just mentioned, global mortality decreased from 2000 to 2021, though those patterns were really quite variable around the world and not consistent. There were 70% of all deaths in 2021 occurred in males, but I hope that across all these figures, I've really demonstrated that 
all people are impacted by carbon monoxide poisoning deaths. So young children contribute many years of life lost, whereas the largest number of deaths are in adults and the highest death rates are in the elderly. So carbon monoxide poisoning really has an impact on everyone. I do want to make sure to mention that there are some key limitations with this paper and our analysis. And one of those, perhaps the most important, is that there's little data available for certain parts of the world, as I showed on one of the first, or the very first map earlier in the presentation. And even with our existing data, there are some challenges. First, would, first of those would be that um, carbon monoxide poisoning deaths are often underreported, and there's lots of challenges with accurate coding and diagnosis for carbon monoxide poisoning deaths, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And secondly, even with um, deaths that are coded with ICD codes, there are challenges and nuances around that. Specifically, um, we ideally want to use data that uses the most detailed version of ICD codes, meaning that they specify four digit detail, not just X47, but they include that fourth digit as well. And we would also ideally want data that provides supplementary codes, such as T58, to ensure that we are um, most accurately defining and identifying carbon monoxide poisoning deaths. But it's very uncommon that um, we are able to use data that includes this level of detail. Additionally, um, I know I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, this paper and these results only capture one aspect of carbon monoxide poisoning. So these deaths are only unintentional non-fire related carbon monoxide poisoning. And so it's only one piece of the entire carbon monoxide poisoning mortality picture. And those other deaths that are fire related and are, um, un are, or are intentional are captured as part of GBD, but they're captured elsewhere. So the fire related carbon monoxide poisoning deaths are captured as part of our cause of death due to fires category. And then, of course, uh, intentional deaths like suicides by carbon monoxide poisoning would be captured as suicides. So they're captured as part of GBD, but not reported with this group as total carbon monoxide poisoning. And lastly, um, we don't yet know how carbon monoxide poisoning rates were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's not something that we had enough information or were able to capture as part of this paper and this analysis. One other um, piece of information that I thought might be interest might be of interest to this audience, but was not explicitly part of the paper was non-fatal carbon monoxide poisoning. So this paper only focused on deaths, but I wanted to make sure to mention that as part of GBD, we also produce estimates of non-fatal carbon monoxide poisonings. But I think um, from this angle or looking at non-fatal poisonings, there are even more challenges with data than there are on the death side. Um, particularly, one of those is that our current non-fatal estimation process for carbon monoxide poisoning relies really heavily on inpatient hospital data. But we know that lots of carbon monoxide poisoning incidents would only present to the emergency department or never appear in healthcare records at all. So it's likely that we are underestimating carbon monoxide poisoning incidents by relying so heavily on inpatient hospital admission data. And additionally, um, given some of the challenges around accurately um, assessing and diagnosing carbon monoxide poisoning in the first place, given some of the nondescript symptoms and the way that it presents, there could be, and there likely is a lot of underreporting and miscoding in the data in general. But this is something that I am interested and we want to focus on, and, um, focus on more heavily going forward since we know that really severe cases of carbon monoxide poisoning can have quite a long-term impact on health and well-being. So we want to make sure we're doing a good job to capture that as well. So what's, what's next for us in terms of carbon monoxide poisoning and GBD when thinking outside of the paper and about um, the way we capture carbon monoxide poisoning more generally as part of the Global Burden of Disease study? I think first and foremost, um, we're always adding more data. So as I've talked about, um, our modeling tools can make estimates in the absence of data, but that's really challenging, particularly when there are countries or entire regions that are data sparse. So we're always interested in adding more data and working to do that. Additionally, um, as we continue to get data for more recent years, hopefully that will allow us to understand better what the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was 
on carbon monoxide poisoning around the world. And that would be pretty interesting to better understand and analyze as part of our work. Additionally, um, there are some parts of the world where we really don't know a lot about why carbon monoxide poisoning is happening, both in places that don't have data where we don't know much at all, and even some places where we do have data, there's still not a lot we know about um, kind of the variation between countries and why certain countries have higher rates than others. And so that's one of the reasons, or one of the reasons that we or I appreciate opportunities like this to share knowledge and connect with experts and learn from people that have more country specific knowledge and experience. And lastly, both our goal with this paper and with GBD more generally um, for carbon monoxide poisoning, like I mentioned at the beginning, was to bring attention to this really preventable cause of death in the hopes that um, it will help to spur further reductions in mortality since we know many of these deaths are very preventable. We hope to um, contribute to improving that. So as um, I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the paper and the work that's done for as part of the GBD more generally is all uh, made possible by IHME at the University of Washington. And so I would be very um, remiss if I did not say a huge thank you to all of my co-authors on the paper and my colleagues at IHME who contributed both to the manuscript itself as well as the GBD project more generally. It literally would not be possible without them, so I am very appreciative of all of their work and contributions. And I also want to make sure to say thank you to our GBD collaborator network who helps to provide uh, really critical feedback on our data methods and manuscripts. And so if anyone's interested in learning more about the work that's being done at IHME or on GBD, or um, perhaps interested in even joining our collaborator network, I've included information to do that here. We really um, appreciate the opportunity to connect with people and work with our GBD collaborators as it um, gives us insights into specific countries and specific data sources. And our collaborators really help us to understand um, country specific data sources and patterns that we see around the world, provide feedback on manuscripts um, and really help make our estimates better. So that's a really valuable part of working on GBD for me. So with that, I'm happy to wrap up and will be happy to answer questions and want to make sure again to say thank you to Adrian and the CEO Research Trust for having me to share this paper with you today. Thanks, Madeline. That was a really super presentation. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat and I have a question or two on my phone from people who can't <laughs> access the chat for some reason. But as I'm chairing this, I get to go first. Um, I'm going to abuse that privilege a little bit, if that's OK. Um, in the presentation, you talked about um, in the modeling, you talked about you use um, data you have around education, income access to health care um, and socio socioeconomic factors um you know we we know we we, we know that co doesn't discriminate but that it could affect anybody regardless of all those factors but these things put people at greater risk and perhaps vulnerability uh or susceptibility to, to to carbon monoxide um i just wonder what 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 um sources you use to sort of model uh, those those other factors um the reason i ask is just that you know one of one of the things that we are doing is to try and start to understand um carbon monoxide from a sort of qualitative perspective rather than a quantitative perspective and it'd just be good to get a bit of a feel for how you how you quantify those things I mean, we'll be coming at it from a different angle but i was just curious really yeah great question so um i think the first thing to say is that this, a lot of that work, so the work done to estimate um, both education patterns around the world globally, as well as what we call sociodemographic index, which is made up of um, information on income, um, fertility, and education, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head. So it's kind of like a composite indicator of a country's level of development and sociodemographic status. Those are things that um, IHME puts a lot of effort into estimating and capturing, but those are things that happen on a different team. So those cool. are not things that I myself um, <laughs> spend a lot of time in the weeds yeah. with, but 
Um, that's definitely something I could look into a little more to provide information for you, but I know that there's a lot that goes into understanding um, each of those components. So that's collecting information on like GDP per capita, um, collecting information on um, years of education in all countries around the world. Yeah, those are two of the key components. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know if I can speak to the, the some of the nitty gritty for those off the top yeah, of my head. But... <laughs> yeah. And I was curious whether that kind of data, you know, um, you have more of that across the globe. I mean, the countries that, you know, where, where there is less information about carbon monoxide incidents, you know, is, is, is information generally poorer in those countries for other risk factors and other diseases mm -hmm. and injuries? Or is it just that in particular carbon monoxide being what it is, it's either not on their radar, so it's not part of that suite of data that they collect information on, or there isn't the infrastructure there to collect data and draw it all together? Yeah, good question. I think a little bit of all of the above, and I think it varies country to country. Um, I can definitely speak to some of the other injury topics we model in that, and I can kind of speak to data availability for road injuries or road traffic accidents, for example, is much better than it is for carbon monoxide poisoning, just because I think so many more countries are aware of kind of the burden and the impact of road traffic injuries, and it's a much bigger um, contribution to deaths and injuries in lots of other places. And so we have many more data sources that capture that type of information versus carbon monoxide poisoning, for example. So um, at least when comparing carbon monoxide poisoning to other injuries, I know that we have a lot more countries that have data for those types of injuries like road traffic injuries versus carbon monoxide poisoning. And again, um, kind of like you were asking, I don't know, I'm not as familiar with the data landscape for something like data on education, but I would imagine, and kind of my hunch is that we do have a lot more data for something like that than for some of this really detailed yeah. cause of death data. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess things like road traffic accidents, the um, the non-fatal injuries, you know, you're much more likely to catch them, aren't you? <laughs> you know, whereas, you know, non-fatal carbon monoxide exposure can go on for a long time and people not be aware um yeah um and and around those steps talk about what's next um we have a sort of you know de developing sort of burgeoning international network of researchers that we're pulling together partly to look at how we can best use our funding to support a better understanding of carbon monoxide exposure um it'd be interesting to sort of to you know um perhaps and this is something we can pick up separately but really is to understand how we can we can sort of leverage our network to support the work that you do um and fill in some of those gaps because you know we do have information perhaps on sort of regional countrywide basis on how data is collected what the gaps are what the problems are and the problems are numerous as i'm sure you know um and it might be interesting just to, to overlay some of the things that we do know with the data that you collect um i'm conscious that we've only got 15 minutes left and there are a few questions now in the chat the um the only other thing I was going to ask was about the data related to COVID. It'd be quite interesting to see what comes of that. Um, when do you think that was sort of washed through? When will you have, you know, uh, insight into that data? And when will like, that be something that you'll look at or be available? I'm quite curious to see the effect that it has, you know. Yeah, I think that's something that um, we're working on right now at GBD. We're just starting to get um, more data for the years like 2020, 2021, and um, maybe a little bit for 2022, for example. So we're just now kind of working to understand what's happened in all of that data and what whether <laughs> the quality of that data, what's happened, can we see patterns based on the COVID pandemic? And yeah. so that's something that is a big focus right now at GBD across many topics. So um, cool. that's something we're starting to look into now, I would say. So I don't know exactly how soon that's information that would be um, easily analyzed or shared, but it's a big focus of us or of ours internally right now yeah i mean i think you know the pandemic was a was a real catalyst in terms of shining a light on um on, on the indoor environment and people thinking about air quality in a way that you know they turn on the tap in the house and they they look at the waters running brown or something you know they they, they won't drink the water but people don't tend to or weren't tending to think so much about the air that they were breathing um anyway i'm conscious of time so let's have a look in the 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 um the chat here um 
sorry, bear with me. Technology is not being my friend. Uh, um, okay, if we start at the at the top here, um, so we have a couple of questions from um, Stephanie Trotter. Stephanie is the president of the CEO Gas Safety Charity, which is a campaigning charity that's been going for almost um, 20 years. No, is it 30 years, Stephanie? It's 30 years. Sorry, she'll be shouting down a microphone at me if she was live. It's the 30 years next year. Um, and Stephanie asks, in the UK, one of the main problems with data on CO deaths is the lack of testing on death. Are there other countries in particular, do this, does the US have testing for CO on death? So at the coronial stage. Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know that um, that's one of the reasons that we think that carbon monoxide deaths are likely very underreported is that it's hard to know without doing those more thorough tests or having strong circumstantial evidence to suggest that the cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning. And I'm not yeah. familiar with for the U.S. or other countries, whether there's processes in place to automatically test for that always. Yeah. So that kind of leads on to a question we had from Izzy. We'll come back to Stephanie's other question in a moment. Um, Isabella Myers, who is the chair of POMED, which is the um, medical and healthcare subgroup of our all-party parliamentary group, a government cross-government group, um, she says, a really super presentation. Thank you, Madeline. How do you think the introduction of ICD-11 might impact your work on CO? Will it allow eventually... For the calculation of morbidity effects that we see due to CO. I believe that this is something that's currently hard to calculate. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't, um, that's not something I've looked into thoroughly yet for carbon monoxide poisoning specifically. I know that um, I'm not sure how soon ICD-11 will actually kind of make it to GBD and <laughs> will be implemented. Yeah. We are able to capture um, morbidity due to carbon monoxide poisoning with ICD-9 and ICD-10 currently, but I'm not um, explicitly familiar yet with the ways that ICD-11 will differ from ICD-10. So if that's something that anyone here actually has more information about, I'd be very curious to kind of hear what might be changing. But yeah, that is that will be new to me as well. Yeah, I think I think that there's a, a greater granularity in terms of the, the way that it's recorded. But as you say, it's getting countries to adopt it use it and then it feeds through to you guys um but perhaps that's something we can we can pick up uh, uh let's have a look uh there are clearly countries that have a serious problem with co and these appear to be well recorded do you have any th thoughts on the countries that don't have co as much on their radar and therefore don't record cases due to misdiagnosis does that put ambiguity around the data from these countries yeah um I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question properly, but um, I think there are kind of two challenges when I think about the countries that either report um, very low rates or don't have data. And so from that perspective, it's really hard for us to know whether the low rates are coming from the low data and whether that's true or just because it's something that's not captured really well in the data itself. And that's when we really um, would depend on country um, experts who have a better understanding of what is happening with carbon monoxide poisoning yeah. in those places. So that'd be quite an interesting thing to follow up with and perhaps drill down into some of those individual countries. Um, we had another question from Stephanie. Um, you showed the graph of the total deaths and you saw the decrease over the 20 years. A little bit like a sort of the Big Dipper kind of fairground ride. Um, do you have any ideas about what contributed to that decrease in deaths over that time period? What factors? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things and it varies country to country. So I think some of it comes from um, continuing to switch away from carbon based fuels and improving um, heating and cooking equipment, safety features and practices in a variety of countries. I think it um, comes from increased education about um, the dangers of carbon monoxide poisoning and what the warning signs are, but I really think it just kind of varies country to country in terms of what the most commonly used fuels are for heating and cooking, what the practices are for um, carbon monoxide poisoning um, prevention, whether they're carbon monoxide alarms, whether they're mandated, it's a variety of factors, I think. Yeah. So again, that would be another interesting thing to follow up and perhaps do some comparisons between you know, some of those countries that perhaps have the greatest amount of regulation and, and awareness and work done on CO, some of those sort of 
they're all in the middle to pick out some of those differences. Thank you. Um, uh, Heather Jarman, who is um, a researcher and emergency physician at St George's Teaching Hospital in South London, she asked whether it'd be possible to put the collaborators link in the chat or we can circulate it afterwards if that's possible. Um, yeah. And then... Oh, sorry. I'd be happy to send the slides so the link would be there. And I can also super. find the link to put in the chat right now, too. Great. That's super. Okay. What we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll follow up after the meeting and we'll circulate the slide deck, which I'll have the link in it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay. So on Deb asks, in your research, how much of a role do you see portable jack gas generators playing in driving incidents and mortality, um, especially in higher income Western EU countries? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, it's hard to know from the data that we get specifically, since a lot of the time it our data doesn't distinguish between what the source of carbon monoxide poisoning was. But anecdotally, from the literature, um, what I've understood for countries that do have the granularity to look at this more specifically is that portable generators have become kind of an increasingly large problem and a source of carbon monoxide poisoning, specifically when they're used maybe indoors or in garages or in enclosed areas where carbon monoxide levels can really build up quickly. So yeah. that's something I wish we were able to say more conclusively from our data specifically is, you know, where's the poisoning occurring and what was the source? But from the literature, that's my understanding. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Dickinson, um, who is a researcher at Imperial College in London. Um, he says, great talk. Can you explain why the, um, why the recent percentage increases in mortality were much worse in the US and Canada? Yeah, I can. That's a good question. Um, I think there are kind of two things to point out. One is that there was a study that was published recently by the US Consumer Product Commission, I believe is the acronym that found that there's been actually a slight increase in the incidence of carbon monoxide poisoning due to like consumer products like generators and all those types of things. So that was pretty interesting in that it actually showed a little bit in terms of what the different sources are that had led to that. But the United States is also one of the places that I'm aware of where we really have these challenges with ICD coding in that um, when we look at the underlying data, we can see that there are a number of deaths that are coded to that X47 code, but that do not have the associated T58 code. So there are some deaths that could be included in there that are due to um, gases other than carbon monoxide poisoning that could be artificially inflating that a little bit. So we do know from the study done by the Consumer Product Commission that some of that is true and associated with consumer products, but there are also some coding challenges there that could be leading to um, some artificial inflation, I guess I would say. So that's something that we really are struggling with on the data side is when these things happen and we have different types of granularity and data from different countries, how to navigate that. Okay, thank you. Um, just looking down the, the, the list of, of questions. Um, just one final one from me, um, and just to put you on the spot, um, in terms of those limitations in in data, what would be the, you know, top three quick wish list of what would you change or what would you like to be able to do in order to, you know, improve the data that you're getting? Is it different sources? Is it, you know, different methodology? I mean, what, yeah, what, what would you say would be, you know, the three things? I think the first would just be having more data. That would be... <laughs> the first wish list item just because there are so many places where we don't have any right now so it's hard for us to know kind of what is happening with carbon monoxide poisoning in those places and then once we have data then it's a lot easier to kind of assess okay when talking with country experts is it um do we believe this data is it underestimating is it overestimating so i think the first thing would just be to have more available data for certain countries but then the next top thing i would say is increased um, or improved granularity in the data. So when we do have those um, ICD codes that are much more detailed and provide um, like the four digit detail that helps to give us information into what the setting and the source was for carbon monoxide poisoning. So that would help us to kind of better understand some of the patterns 
that we're seeing and give us much more insight into our estimates instead of um, just kind of looking at like the total level. Right. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I've got one last question here, and this is another one from Izzy. Um, have there been any global changes in the way that diseases or non-communicable diseases have been tackled based on the great work that the IHME does? Can you say that again? Have there been right, any? Yeah, of course. <laughs> have there, uh, it, um, let's turn the question around. Based on the great work that the IHME does, have there been any changes in the way disease or global well, communicable diseases have been, sorry, non-communicable diseases have been tackled? Did I get that out? <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I get your question. I think, I don't know if I can speak to that for all diseases, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but I think one of the coolest things that um, is part of my work is when we do get to connect with um, collaborators or in-country experts and see how they are using our data and our estimates. So I don't know if I can think of a specific example off the top of my head for all of GBD, for example, but just hearing about the ways that our data is making it to ministries of health or to specific um, country collaborators and the way that they're using it to kind of understand patterns in their countries and um, even like teaching classes on GBD, for example, I think it's great that our um, results and estimates get out there and then we're allowed, to, we're able to connect with people and kind of figure out how to make our work um, better and how we can make it better for both countries and for specific di like disease interest groups and the ways that um, we can improve our estimates to be usable for everybody. So I don't know if that totally answers your question because I can't think of a, a specific no. example off the top of my head, but I think that's one of the, the strengths of GBD and one of the things yeah. that's fun for me working in this role. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I think from, from, from you know, our perspective as an as a organization that supports research, you know, when I look at the data and look at the information, I think to myself, okay, well, you know, the countries that seem to be doing it well and you've seen this reduction, what can we learn from that? It'd be quite interesting to, you know, look at your collaborators in those particular countries and actually have conversations with them. What can we learn that we can take away and use in other countries? And, you know, if, if, in terms of the way that the data is collected on the one hand, but also the interventions which have brought those numbers down. Um, so, yeah, no, no, I think it's a, a really rich a rich scene for us. And it's a shame we've only had an hour um, to talk about mm -hmm. it, but hopefully it's something that we can pick up again later. Um, I'm conscious that it is coming up to 10 o'clock in Seattle and 5 o'clock here in the UK, so we're going to have to draw this to a close in a moment. Um, I'm going to give you one, line or one final thought, um, opportunity for anyone to put any more remaining questions in the chat. Um, but if not, we can um, pick up any questions afterwards if you want to email them through to us. We can share them with Madeline and uh, um, um, we can um, we can get back to you on that. Um, just to let you know, um, next month we have our final lecture in this third series of lectures and we'll be joined by Andy Humber who is formerly of the London um, Ambulance Service. Andy has been um, a keen advocate for improving the way that the ambulance services and paramedics deal with carbon monoxide over many, many years. He's coming to talk about his experience and what he thinks needs to be done. That's gonna take place on the 24th of April at 2 p.m. Um, and finally, if I'm allowed to, um, and I am because this is my call, um, the court, we've got our CO research conference, which is taking place on the 18th and 19th of June. And that will take place in Edgbaston in Birmingham. Um, the conference is free and we have a preferential rate for people who are signing up who want to stay over the hotels and that offer runs till the 15th of April. Um, you can find out more details on our website, which is coresearchtrust.org, um, and you can sign up via that. Um, so I think that's it from us. Um, all that remains to say is thanks to Kimberly and the team for organising the event. Thank you so much to Madeline and the team at IHME for organising the collection of the data for getting the, the um, paper published in The Lancet, and most importantly, for coming and talking to us today, um, first thing in the morning. Um, hope everyone has a great day, and thank you so much for joining us. We'll be sharing the presentation um, in the coming days. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Madeline. Bye-bye.
Bye.